Well, hello and welcome to the Oxford Socratic Society's official YouTube channel. My name is Alex O'Connor, co-founder and former president of SoxSoc, and today we have the good fortune to be joined by Professor Roger Crisp, who is here to address us on the topic of objective morality. And we thought we'd sit down for a moment and talk a little bit about morality for people who couldn't make the event in person. Uh, the motion tonight is whether there is such a thing as objective morality. What does it mean for ethics to be objective, and why is that important? Well, I think it's one of those uh, words that one has to define um, without implying that somebody who uses the word in a different way is using it wrongly. And I think tonight what I mean by morality as being objective is that the claims within it about how we should act um, are truth apt, they could be true or, or false um, and that they're made true if they are true or false if they're false by the facts and you might then say well okay what are facts and of course we could go on all night about facts if you wanted but I hope that would be enough to give you a rough idea yeah, I know a lot of people will, if you are somebody who thinks that ethics is a real thing but a subjective thing uh, based on interest or, or preference or something like this, that they might still think that moral claims are truth apt, it's just that they can be subjectively true or false. Would you say that that's a misguided view of what subjective ethics would be? Uh, I think... I there are people who've done this and they have views of truth which would be more minimal than mine. Um, so you're quite right that you, you, can, you, can, you, you can play with the notion of truth so the subjective view could allow for truth. Mm. But I think I'm, I'm really thinking of truth in the way that most people think about it. Mm. I'm imagining somebody who thinks that, well... Ethics is just essentially a euphemism for, for preference. You know, when I say that murder is wrong, it means something like, I don't like murder. And so it's true for me that murder is wrong. And the thing that makes it true is the fact that, psychologically speaking, I don't like murder. Um, but because that fact is a fact about my brain, even though it seems to be a fact that makes something true, true for me, maybe in the way that it can be true for me that... You know, it's it's not raining outside, but it's true for somebody in, I don't know, somewhere else in the country or somewhere else in the world that it is. It's it's true that it's not raining for me, but it seems somehow dependent on the subject. It seems to me that a definition of ethics that says it's objective if it's truth apt and it's made true by facts might be countered by a subjectivist with, with reference to that kind of uh, truth and falsity about the state of a person's mind, you know. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, if, if we take the view that you called subjective, according to which um, the statement X is wrong means I don't like X, uh, that's an objective view, according to me. So that would be a, a, a kind of objective ethics? Uh, yeah, it would be a very odd view. So what are some examples of things that are not objective ethical theories that uh, would you say that it would have to be something that's that has no truth aptness like ethical emotivism or something like that or is is it that anything that any system of ethics in which you can describe propositions as true and false is going to be objective in your in your understanding yeah so emotivism is is, is a good example i think many so-called subjectivist views have a specter of emotivism uh, behind them so if we understand emotivism as the view that when somebody says that, some, uh, that X is wrong, they're essentially saying, boo to X, down with X, they're expressing an emotion. As you say, that's not truth apt. Mm. That would clearly count in the sense I'm using as a subjectivist view. But you know, because it's philosophy, people mean all sorts of things by objectivism and subjectivism. And... Uh, I think the, the other kinds of views that you were talking about, according to which, for example, uh, morality rests on our preferences in some way or our desires and is in that sense contingent, um, those people who could come up with a minimalist uh, account of truth, uh, allowing them to, to talk about moral judgments as true or false, without, as it were, translating them into uh, propositions. I mean, um, there's, not there's to do with morality. Certainly a sense in which 
some forms of utilitarianism, which is one of the first objective ethical theories that people will come across, uh, can be said to be dependent upon brain states. Uh, if you've got a a form of utilitarianism that says that we should be maximizing pleasure and the reason for that is because people desire pleasure, then the fact that makes this ethical truth is something about somebody's preference, which is essentially their preference for pleasure. It might be a sort of tautological preference, but uh, maybe the subjectivist who thinks that something being based on a brain state makes it subjective would have to call utilitarianism subjective for that reason. I'm not sure. Um, but I wonder what you think of the claim that's often made, and I think there's often an implicit assumption that it will be discussed when people talk about there being or there not being objective ethics, that objective ethics is only possible with some kind of moral authority that looks like some kind of god or creator or author of the moral truth. Mm. What do you make of that claim, and why do you think it's such a popular one? Um, well, I mean, the, the that claim, I think... Um was first discussed in philosophy, as far as we're concerned, by Plato in his uh, dialogue with Euthyphro, which is thought to be one of his earlier dialogues. Uh, and that, that dialogue is about the nature of piety. Uh, and they get to a point which is often called the Euthyphro Dilemma, where Euthyphro, this uh, interlocutor of Socrates, uh, is asked to say whether he thinks that things are pious because the gods are like them, or do the gods like them because they're pious? So that's the sort of decision we're having to make here. Why do people feel the need for authority? Well, it could be because they're inclined to think that we, we need the gods in our account of piety or rightness and wrongness or whatever it is, because otherwise there wouldn't be any moral truths or moral facts they somehow have to be made true by god or whoever it is by the, by the individual with authority but i think people who are uh skeptical um about theism for example or theists who have a a more robust conception of morality will say no you know these things stand on their own uh if if uh, things are pious the gods may well like them because they're pious but they're not pious because the gods like them in that sense i, I think a, a struggle that people will have in saying that there is an objective truth and as you've defined it this means moral statements that are truth apt and the thing that determines their truth value are the facts generally speaking when we're talking about facts we're talking about descriptive facts facts about the way things are facts about the universe and famously, it's impossible on uh, many people, in many people's opinion, I should say, because some people surely deny it, that you can derive ought from is is, that you can get moral statements that are made true by non-moral statements. So when you say that there might be a conception of objective ethics, which is, uh, and these propositions are made true by the facts, are those facts necessarily prescriptive facts, or can moral claims be made true by descriptive, non-moral facts? Um, well, no, <clears throat> they, they can't, but uh, I don't think this is a problem for the realists because they'll say you're, uh, you're rigging the game by uh, not allowing there to be moral facts to start with. So it could be that you can only draw a moral conclusion from a set of premises including a moral claim, uh, but there's nothing to stop the realists saying that moral claim is made true by a moral fact. Uh, to be clear, realist here, for our listeners, is a moral realist, which is someone who believes that morality is objective. Yeah. Um, for such a person who says, okay, well, yes, you can only describe prescriptive, that is, you know, moral uh, ought statements from other moral ought statements, you require some kind or some set, perhaps, of fundamental prescriptive fact in the way that descriptive epistemology probably requires some fundamental descriptive fact that the universe exists that our sense data is accurate something something like this do you think there is a, a fundamental moral prescription that we can boil objective ethics down to is it a set of prescriptions or can we not know what these prescriptions would actually be uh, well i'm inclined to think that there 
there is a set. I mean, it may include only one principle, I don't know. Um, because uh, it, it seems to me that certain normative or moral um, propositions are very hard to deny if we use normative in a broad sense. So, for example, it seems to me that um, it, it's true that severe suffering is bad for me. That seems like an evaluative fact. It seems to me that, at least other things being equal, I have a reason to avoid severe suffering. That's a, a normative fact about reasons that I have to act. So I, I suspect that the truth about... Um, value and about reasons will consist in the correct set of such propositions and I'd be very surprised if the two I mentioned weren't in there mm. One, I, I certainly would say that any attempts to objectify ethics without God at least tend to start with something like at least human suffering being bad in some respect even if just for that one person you said that to be an objective moral statement it must be made true by the facts and so when we talk about the fundamental moral prescriptions at the basis of our ethical epistemology, you could ask, well, if we have this fundamental principle, you know, human suffering is bad, or, or my suffering is bad for me, something more modest like that, for that to be objectively true, at least on the definition that you were working on earlier, that itself would have to be something that's made true by the facts. Or would you say that those are some forms of objective moral truths that are immune from being made true by other facts about the universe? What, what's the fact that's being? What's the proposition that's being made true? Or whatever the fundamental ethical prescription would be. So whatever it breaks down to. If you keep asking, well, what makes P true? Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, um, you get to a point where you either have to say that you have a necessarily true moral statement, good. which seems good, tricky to to justify to make yeah. it necessarily true. Mm, no, because I think it would be true in all possible worlds that any sentient individual has a reason to avoid suffering. Mm. So it is a necessary truth. But reason there, when you say any sentient being has a reason, because you, you could put it in the conditional, because somebody might say, well, how can it be true in all possible worlds that human suffering is bad when there are possible worlds where there are no humans? But we'll say it's true in all possible worlds that if there are sentient creatures yeah, that's like what, humans, that's the claim. then you said they have <clears throat> reasons to avoid harm. Are those reasons more like the way that somebody might have reason to put money in a bank account, that is, that translates to something like it is within their self-interest? Or is it reason, as in the moral sense, of justif a justification for acting? Because I could say you have reason to put money in the bank account, but I wouldn't say that's a prescriptive ought that binds you, morally speaking. It just means something like, well, this is in your self-interest. In the same sense, it seems very obvious as obvious to me as it does as seemingly to you that any sentient creature has reason to avoid harm but that seems to me just to translate as that that being uh, that being self-interest is served by it avoiding harm mm. rather than it being justified in prescribing a sense of having to avoid this harm you know well i think i mean i was talking about reasons uh, and i'm inclined to think that if we can answer the questions we want answered in terms of reasons uh, then we don't need to go on to ask whether some of them are binding or not. That seems to me an unnecessary question if, of course, we can weigh reasons against one another and decide what we have strongest reason to do. You're quite right that I started with, with self-interest, what some people call prudence. Uh, that's just because it seems to me even clearer <laughs> that I have a reason to avoid pain uh, than that I have a reason to take steps to avoid your feeling pain. Though, in fact, I do, would believe both. That's the difficult jump to make, though, in so many cases. Uh, it's where I think utilitarians in particular have their, the, the most work to do in saying from an intuitive injunction that I myself should avoid my own suffering, it just seems self-evidently bad if there's such a thing as badness. It must consist in that kind of experience. But to then say it's bad generally for suffering to occur or it's bad for me for your suffering to occur 
such that I have a prescription to minimize your suffering as well as mine, that universalization of the avoidance of suffering principle seems to be a bit of a hurdling block. How might somebody um, get over that? Yeah, good point. Um, I mean, what I, w I certainly wasn't trying to do was to prove any kind of moral principle, utilitarian or other uh, principle, from some kind of egoistic premise. Um, I wasn't trying to do that. I'm not saying you couldn't do it with some extra premises, and obviously people like Mill and Sidrick and other people have have attempted to do that. Um, I was really doing it uh, just purely because um, it, I think it seems more persuasive. Mm. Because many people are egoists still, not in philosophy, but outside philosophy they are. So if one is engaged with, in a discussion about reasons and objectivity, one might as well start with egoistic reasons. So to be clear then, if we're going to have objective ethics and objective ethics means that the propositions are made true by the facts, then you have this chain of P being made true by R, R being made true by Q. For any system of objective ethics, do we have to terminate in some necessary moral truth? Um, yes. And you think maybe we, we can't quite put a finger on what that is at the moment? No, not at the moment we can't. Does I'm that make it impossible to have any moral knowledge if the justification, if the chain of justification eventually terminates in somewhere a bit mysterious and dark that we can't access. Yeah, I, personally I think it does about most questions. Um, but that's again why I, I chose the examples I did. Because I think in, in, in the ordinary sense of knowledge, I know that suffering is bad for me. And yeah, I, th yeah, I, would, I would claim to know that I have a reason to take steps to... Um, decrease your suffering or remove it. Is that knowledge on par with descriptive knowledge? Is it on par with your knowledge that the external world exists, with your knowledge that the Earth orbits the Sun? Is it a different kind of knowledge? Do you believe it as well, strongly? Yeah, that sounds like um, knowledge gained through the senses or empirical mm -hmm. knowledge. Uh, whereas I think this uh, knowledge I'm talking about is knowledge gained through what philosophers call intuition. Mm. So it comes when you grasp what suffering is, when you grasp what reasons are. Mm. I mean, it seems almost tautological to say that suffering is just that which a sentient creature has an interest in avoiding. It's what suffering might be. I think Derek Parfit defines suffering as that which is not wanted when experienced or something like this. Yeah, I would disagree with him about that. Mm. Um, I, I think it's a kind of sensation. Right. So maybe that's a form of sense data. It's the sensation of the suffering, the sensation of the moral feeling that's at the oh, basis of all Oh, pain is, yeah. But the, the but judgment that it's bad is not. Yeah, that's, that's intuition. Not. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Um, thanks. And uh, before we shut off, I wanted to ask if people are interested in, in discussing or learning about this further, do you have any resources that you could point them to, like a particular book about objectivity and ethics or anything like this that they should start with? Well, to be honest, I would recommend Henry Sidrick's uh, Methods of Ethics, which, like many other people, I think is the best book on ethics ever written. Um, so dip into that, but also read some Plato, uh, read some Hume, read some Mill, read some Bernard Williams. There's a lot of very good stuff to read. Yeah, well, we'll make sure that everything relevant is linked in the description down below. Uh, but with that, thanks for sitting down with us, and thank you, everybody, for watching. <laughs>